All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Seasteading Institute intern Melissa Roth. Uh, she has a freshly minted degree in chemical engineering and physics, uh, and she's currently at the U.S. Army's Natick Research Center. She'll be presenting on the work she did in her internship. So hello, my name is Melissa Roth, and here I've reviewed the sustainable energy options for a small seastead. So the goal of this project was to determine the cost in kilowatt hours um, for different energy sources. So preferably this energy source would be renewable, but diesel was used here as a baseline estimate. Also explored were ocean thermal energy conversion, or OTEC, photovoltaic solar panels, and also offshore wind. And these estimates were based on a five megawatt capacity. So the desirable qualities, as mentioned, would be renewable. Um, however, I did explore diesel. Um, it would also be safe and also relatively inexpensive, um, and also feasible given the size and weight restraints of the seastead. So the cost of energy generated by a diesel engine was explored as a baseline. Um, diesel generators are convenient because they're safe and the energy production can be easily scaled to suit the seastead's needs, which would be particularly helpful if the Seasteading Institute does plan on starting small and scaling up. Um, they're also convenient because they can run continuously, which would eliminate the need for an expensive energy storage system, which can usually increase the cost of the installation, um, sometimes doubling it. So. To calculate the cost of diesel energy, I estimated that for five one megawatt generators at $600,000 each, uh, the fixed capital investment would be around $10.5 million. And this is really low um, considering the cost of renewables, but you'll see that the yearly expenses for fuel at $6 per gallon, uh, the yearly operating and maintenance costs, and also depreciation, the yearly expenses add up to an additional $17.5 million a year. Um, so the levelized cost over the 10-year lifetime of the generators ends up being around 46 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and that's assuming that you're operating at five megawatts 24 hours a day. Ocean thermal energy conversion uses the temperature difference between the deep ocean water and the uh, warmer surface levels um, to drive a Rankine turbine and create energy. It's renewable, and like diesel, it can be run continuously. Um, it also produces desalinated potable water as a byproduct, which can be helpful in offsetting the cost of the plant. Um, it does have a very high capital cost, but it doesn't have the fuel costs associated with something like diesel. Um, but it does limit the location of the seastead because you need at least a 20 degree Celsius difference between the deep water and the surface water to generate net electricity. And the greater that temperature difference, the more energy you produce. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's usually near the equator that you would use this. Um, and there are also many offshore engineering challenges that need to be addressed to make OTEC successful. Um, so the estimates for the fixed capital investment for a five megawatt offshore OTEC plant were between $300 million and $400 million. Um, however, the investment does the investment per megawatt decreases as the size of the plant increases, so it may be a better option for a larger seastead with greater energy needs. Um, but considering the FCI and the yearly operating and maintenance costs, um, the energy from OTEC ends up being between 75 cents and one dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, and this can be offset by selling the potable water that's produced as a byproduct. Um, and that depends on how much it would cost to either import the water, which can be, considering bottled water here, maybe a dollar per gallon, or even uh, depending on the cost of how much it would cost to produce potable water through reverse osmosis, which can vary. Um, so the photovoltaic panels that you see on the roofs of homes and businesses around here are semiconductors. So you take the energy from photons uh, from the sun and you create electricity. The most efficient panel today is around 43.5% efficient. Um, so 43% of the energy radiated on the surface of the panel is converted into actual usable electricity. Um, however, the average panels produced on a large scale 
are only around 15 to 17 percent efficient. So solar farms usually require large amounts of space. Um, assuming that you can cover a 400 by 400 foot seastead in solar panels, you would at most produce 1.8 megawatts, and that's based on the assumption that it's in the Caribbean where it's sunny. Um, however, that 1.8 megawatts is only produced during the sunlight hours, so about six hours per day. Um, and that does not include the need for some sort of storage system like batteries, uh, possibly other methods that you would need to save that energy for later. So assuming a 20 year lifetime and no storage system, the cost of electricity from a solar panel is about $1.10 per kilowatt hour. Um, this is expected to drop significantly as the efficiencies increase and as manufacturing costs decrease. Um, usually if you install one here, it's a lot cheaper because you end up getting subsidies, uh, but that's only if you're connected into the grid, so it doesn't really apply here. So like solar panels, wind farms are also becoming increasingly popular, especially in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Um, for example, there have been several turbines installed near my hometown in Massachusetts, but they're being installed and then almost immediately decommissioned uh, because people are complaining about the noises. And so one solution to this is offshore wind. Um, and offshore wind farms do exist, uh, but the technology for our floating platforms has yet to be fully developed. So the cost of wind power is heavily dependent on the wind speed and therefore on the location of this wind farm. The power generated is a function of the wind speed cubed. So for estimates here, I used a net export of 38%, meaning that 38% of the rated energy, so for if I have a 100 kilowatt turbine, I would get 38 kilowatts from this. And that accounts for when the wind is not blowing. Um, and so based on estimates that offshore wind ranges from $4,700 per kilowatt rated installed to $5,500, um, the overall cost of energy is 18 to 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So these estimates are based on offshore wind data from the UK, but these are not meant for deep water. So for deeper waters, you would need like some sort of floating platform um, as a base for your wind turbine. And so there are some in design as shown here. Um, and as of 2011, three of them have been tested. Um, for one company to launch one 2.4 megawatt turbine, um, the cost was $65 million to test it for a year. And so based on that estimate and just the location of it, the electricity cost between six and seven dollars per kilowatt hour. So that would be some sort of technology that might be developed further in the future that might be more viable for future seasons. So as you can see, there's a huge range um, for cost electricity um, and certainly many other options to be explored. Um, renewables, again, it might just be a matter of time for something like solar um, or wind. And also OTEC and wind might be better options for larger seasteads where the cost per megawatt installed decreases as the system increases. Um, and also the estimates shown here are heavily based on location. So again, without knowing the specific design of the seastead, it's difficult to determine what the right source is. Um, so many thanks to Guillaume for his help and also George, um, Professor Ronald Willey at Northeastern and Aeronautica Wind, Puget Sound Solar. Um, and wind power aeronautica. I believe I have a couple minutes for questions. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that uh, OTEC has a uh, affordable water produced as a byproduct. What is the process that's done through and what's the volume of the water that's generated? I think it depends on the system you use. So if you have it depends on whether you use an open cycle or a closed cycle, but sometimes it's just produced through condensation. Um, and in the estimate I used, it was from a report done by Luis Vega, and it was around, I think, 2,200 cubic meters per day. So that was what I used. 
What would these numbers look like for a nuclear, like a nuclear powered aircraft carrier? Um, I didn't look into that. <laughs> Do you know how far the, the, the noise pollution propagates from the wind turbines on the do you know how, how far the, the noise pollution from the wind turbines would propagate on the water? Has there been any, any studies done on that? Because I'm thinking if you if you position like a power generation uh, platform away from the populated area you might get away with that with some transmission lines. That might be something to look into. I haven't found anything yet because the offshore wind farms aren't really near too many habited locations, but I know there was um, one wind farm in Germany where people who lived on an island near this wind farm were complaining of the diesel fumes that were being used to keep the generators continuously running. Uh, did you did you look at um, vertical axis windmills, the ones that those at, at all? Not for price estimates, no. Okay. Excuse me. Could I make a correction? We're negotiating a power purchase agreement with the White Electric Company, and we're offering to sell power via OTEC at 19, 19 cents per quote power. Okay. So the information that you received, I think, is false information or misinformation, probably from the U.S. Department of Energy. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Thanks for that correction. Thanks, Melissa.